When the choir sings like that, I just want to stand up. So consider this a one person standing ovation for the choir. Thanks. <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> This is the third sermon in a series called The God Who Makes Promises. And I want us to pause to consider how remarkable that is. That God would make promises to us. You would expect it to work the other way around. That we would make promises to Him. But here is a God who purges the evil in the world with a cleansing flood and then comes to Noah and says, never again, I promise. A God who comes to Abraham in his childless old age and leads him out under a starry sky and says, look up, someday your descendants will be as countless as the stars, I promise. Or in today's reading, a God who comes to some of those same descendants of Abraham and says to them in the wilderness, if you will be my people, I will be your God, I promise. God comes to us making covenants. And as I used to tell the children in my fourth and fifth grade Sunday school class, a covenant is a promise. And not just any kind of promise, but a very special and solemn promise. The kind you might make at a wedding. Now, it's been a long time since I was in seminary. But as I recall, in Old Testament times, when one person wanted to make a special and solemn promise to another, he would do it by cutting a covenant. And I use the word cutting quite literally. He would slaughter an animal, a sheep or a goat, and cut it in half and lay those two halves before the other person and say, so may the Lord do to me and more if I ever break my promise to you. Now that's the kind of visual aid that will stick with you. If you ever even thought about breaking your promise, all you would have to do is remember the two bloody halves of that animal's carcass, and it would inspire you to do some covenant keeping. In fact, it's almost a shame that we don't do that sort of thing with some of our modern day covenants. The marriage covenant, for instance. Don't you think it would be memorable if somewhere during the ceremony the father of the bride would pull out a live chicken and put it up on the chopping block and bring out a meat cleaver and cut it into two pieces and look at the groom and say, that's what I'm going to do to you if you ever break my daughter's heart. Maybe I'm just thinking these thoughts because my own daughter is getting married soon. But I think if you included that kind of ritual in the ceremony, divorce rates around the world would begin to drop. As I said, it's a visual aid that sticks with you. But remember that in the original covenant-making ceremony, no one said, that's what I'm going to do to you if you break this promise. But instead, may the Lord do so to me and more if I ever break my part of the promise. That's an important distinction. You weren't threatening someone else when you did it. You were wishing it on yourself. That's how committed you were to keeping the promise. Seen in this way, the covenant is not a mandatory but a voluntary thing. It's not a shotgun wedding where the father of the bride forces some young man to marry his daughter but a wonder of love in which two people gladly make their promises to each other through the expression of their vows. I, John, take you, Mary, to be my lawfully wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish as long as we both shall live. Can you hear it? I, John, it's a personal responsibility. Take you, Mary. It's a voluntary commitment to be my lawfully wedded wife. It is a solemn and binding covenant. 
without having to sacrifice a single chicken. Most marriages could be made stronger if both parties would simply keep the promises they made on their wedding day. Think about a marriage in which each partner really had and held each other, when things were good and when they were not, when there was money and when there wasn't, when they were healthy and when they were sick. Think about a marriage in which each partner really spent some time loving and cherishing the other every day as long as they both should live. It would be a wonderful marriage. But a marriage like that is made only by free and mutual covenant keeping. Push too hard from either side, make too many demands, and the whole thing will collapse. Now, I say all this about marriage and covenants and chickens in order to say this about the Ten Commandments. They are not just a list of ten rules to live by, although we sometimes think of them that way. Sometimes people will say to me, if everyone would just live by the Ten Commandments, the world would be a better place. And it would, of course it would. If no one ever murdered or stole or lied, if no one ever coveted or committed adultery, if everyone honored their fathers and mothers, we would be fine, wouldn't we? All of us. It's that kind of thinking that put the Ten Commandments up on the walls of public schools all those years ago. And someone said, after nailing them up on the wall, look, kids, while you're learning, learn this. Ten good rules to live by, one for each finger. The only problem with that kind of thinking is that it violates the nature of these commandments. These are not just rules to live by, but the particular terms of a covenant between God and His people. They are intimate and sacred and in that sense more like wedding vows than anything else. You wouldn't nail those to a schoolhouse wall, would you? Of course not. You whisper those vows in holy places, in the sanctity of a wedding ceremony. You speak them to your one true love, making promises you intend to keep forever. Now maybe it would be nice if everybody lived by the wedding vows, but they can't. Can they? You can't have and hold everyone, although some people try. You can only live out those vows in the context of a marriage relationship with another person. It's the same with the Ten Commandments. You can only live them out in the context of a covenant relationship with God. That's why they come where they do in this story. God has liberated His people from their slavery in Egypt, brought them through the waters of the Red Sea, and wooed them in the wilderness. In chapter 19 of Exodus, He proposes marriage to them. He says, If you will obey Me and keep My covenant, you shall be My treasured possession. And the people say, Yes, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. In chapter 20, God, who is so excited about this marriage, writes His own wedding vows. We call them the Ten Commandments. They are spoken by the high priest, Moses, up there on the mountain, and the people say, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. In chapter 24 of Exodus, Moses says, essentially, I now pronounce you God and, and people. And then some oxen are slaughtered for the wedding feast, and Moses takes some of the blood and dashes it on the altar, and he takes some of the blood and sprinkles it on the people and says to them, this is the blood of the covenant. Talk about a visual aid, something you would remember for the rest of your life. But do you see how no one was forced into this agreement? It was voluntary. It is still voluntary. We don't have to be God's people. God isn't going to point a shotgun at us or chop a chicken in half and say, that's what I'll do to you if you won't be mine. We don't have to keep these promises. But I want you to think about how the world might be different if we did, beginning with commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Think about a relationship with God in which we really didn't in which our loyalty and allegiance were devoted to Him and Him alone. 
When anyone asked who was in charge of our lives, we would simply say, Him. No one forced us into this arrangement. We volunteered. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Think about a relationship with God in which we never bent the knee to the gods of money, sex, or power. Never offered our devotion to houses, clothes, or cars. Never depended on our wit or charm or good looks to save us. Only God. Number three, you shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Think about a relationship with Him in which we didn't take the Lord's name in vain through our constant and casual use, but instead whispered it like a prayer, sang it like a love song, recited it like poetry, and lived our lives in such a way that He was never ashamed of His association with us. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Think about a relationship with God in which whether discussing whether or not we should cut the grass on Sunday, we eagerly looked forward to that one day each week we could devote ourselves entirely to Him. Think about wanting to spend time with God the way some people want to spend time with the true love of their life and make plans for it. Number five, honor your father and mother. Think about the generosity of a God who not only includes Himself in these vows, but also our parents. What kind of world would it be if we really did honor our fathers and mothers? If we not only did what they told us when we were young, but asked what we could do for them when they were old. If we never rolled our eyes when we talked about them, but always spoke their names with the kind of reverence and devotion that should be reserved for those who gave us life and sustained it through our youth who loved us and sacrificed for us and endured our teenage years. Number six, you shall not murder. Stretch your imagination a little more. Think about what kind of world it would be if it wasn't only us but everybody who obeyed the Ten Commandments. Think about not murdering, for instance. What would it be like? To be able to walk down the darkest alley in the middle of the night in the biggest city without your heart beating faster, without being afraid that someone might want to do you harm. What kind of world would it be if there were no fear anymore, no need to fear harm from anyone? Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. What kind of world would it be if no one ever did that? If no wives ever had to wonder, no husband ever had to suspect. A world where the institution of marriage was regarded with such reverence that no one would ever look on a married woman with lust in his eye. No woman would ever long for a married man. A world where the wedding band became a high circular wall that would keep improper desires out and proper desires in. That kind of thing might put an end to jealousy and suspicion. Number eight, you shall not steal. What kind of world would it be if nobody ever did that, where you could leave your doors unlocked like some of you used to do in the old days, where you could stack big piles of money on your bed and never worry that someone would break in to steal? A world where you didn't have to have a security system, where you didn't have to be obsessed with locking and guarding and protecting your things because no one would take them anyway. Think of the freedom that would bring, the peace of mind. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is a bigger commandment than simply not lying about things. What kind of world would it be if no one ever talked about you behind your back so that you didn't have to spend time clearing your name? responding to rumors, dealing with slander, but could instead simply live the life God had given you. Think about how much time you would save in not worrying about your reputation, not looking at your every move through the eyes of others. Number 10, you shall not covet. Finally, what kind of world would it be if no one else wanted your things? If they could celebrate with you when you got a raise or a new car rather than making snide remarks about it. 
if they could admire your home, your family, your job, in such a way that you knew they were genuinely glad for you, not secretly wishing you would drop dead so they could have it all. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world? Well, it would. Of course it would. But it is not a world that can be forced. You can't make somebody enter into a covenant even if you cut a chicken in half. This is a voluntary thing in which you and I are absolutely free to keep the commandments or ignore them. But what a world it would be if we kept them. What a world it would be if everybody kept them. I think that's part of our problem. We begin to see the potential in this covenant agreement. We begin to think how wonderful it would be if everybody would keep the Ten Commandments. We start to petition Congress to nail them back up on the schoolhouse walls. But in the end, we have to remember, these are not rules, but vows. And God's proposal in Exodus 19 gives it away. If you will be my people, God says, then I will be your God. And then he waits to see if we will say yes. Even God doesn't force us to say yes. And we can't force anyone else to keep his commandments. But we can do this. We can decide that whether or not anybody else keeps them, we will. We will make God our only God. We will not bow down to any idols. We will not make for ourselves any graven images. We will not take His name in vain. We will remember His day and keep it holy. We will honor our fathers and mothers. We will not murder or think murderous thoughts about another person. We will not commit adultery or lust after anyone. We will not steal from others, friend or foe. We will not bear false witness against our neighbors. And we will not covet anyone else's things or lives or loved ones. The world may not do all those things, but on this day, in this place, we can answer God's promise with a promise of our own. Yes, we can say, we will be your people. We will keep your commandments from this time forth and even forevermore. So help us, God. Shall we pray? God, we thank you for setting these standards before us, for inviting us into this holy covenant with you, like a bride who enters a covenant with her husband. Help us to see how intimate and special these promises are, how they are so much more than simply good rules to live by. When we agree to do these things, we are agreeing to be your people as you have agreed to be our God. Help us to keep that relationship always before us, the preciousness of it always in front of us, so that we know not only what we are doing, but why we are doing it. For your sake, Lord, for the sake of your love for us. We ask these things and we make our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.